Welcome back to Physics Fundamentals. In this video, I'm going to be talking about temperature. The idea of temperature can be one of the most challenging ones to talk about in physics. On one hand, we are all very familiar with temperatures because we get exposed to them in our everyday lives over and over again. For example, I might call up the weather report, which tells me that the high temperature today is going to be 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and the low temperature tonight is going to be 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Right? That's great. I've spent enough time in the world and looking at weather reports that I have a good understanding of what an 80 degree day feels like and what a 40 degree night feels like. On the other hand, what do those numbers really mean? How are they measured? The scales that we use for temperature do not behave the same way as just about any other scales that we come across. Right? An 80 degree day doesn't have twice as much temperature as a 40 degree night. That's nonsense. And so numerically these scales don't make sense, which means that we really have to strive in order to find a way of making temperature make sense. Right, if I can get my head out of the way, a common textbook definition says that temperature describes the way that the molecules which make up an object are vibrating. And there is some truth to this definition, but as we saw previously, That's really the thing that we measure as internal energy, the total kinetic energy of all of the atoms and molecules within an object. That's not to say that the two aren't related. There is a direct relationship between temperature and internal energy of an object. As the internal energy increases, the temperature increases. As the internal energy decreases, the temperature decreases. The problem is that those rates are dependent on a lot of different parameters and not just a direct relationship. So a temperature for a block of steel describes internal energy differently than a temperature of a piece of wood or a temperature of a glass of water. Um, not only that, the shapes of the objects are going to vary. Um, there's a lot of things that go into the relationship, and it's not as clear-cut as that definition makes it sound. Another definition comes back to the equation of heat transfer. The rate at which heat is transferring, or the amount of heat that is transferring, depends on the kind of material, the cross-sectional area, the time, the difference in temperature, and the length, the distance over which that heat has to move. That difference in temperature can in and of itself be used as a definition. In this definition, if two objects are at different temperatures, then heat tends to flow from the higher temperature object to the lower temperature object. If the two objects are at the same temperature, then there will be no heat flow, right? If delta T is zero, then zero times and divided by anything else gives us zero, and the heat flow is zero. If two objects are at the same temperature, no heat flows, we say that these objects are in thermal equilibrium. Right? That's the definition of thermal equilibrium. They're at the same temperature. In the United States, we are most familiar with the Fahrenheit temperature scale. The Fahrenheit temperature scale was designed by Dr. Daniel Fahrenheit, a Polish physicist, who based it on zero degrees being the temperature 
of a particular salt water bath or a salt and ice bath uh, because at the time that was the coldest thing that laboratories were able to produce. And then he based the highest temperature, uh, 100 degrees, on human body temperature, which Dr. Fahrenheit, or all scientists at the time, thought was constant and consistent among all people. It was later found that Dr. Fahrenheit's body temperature was higher than normal, which is why human body temperature uh, standard is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit and not 100 degrees Fahrenheit these days. Um, the relationship between the Fahrenheit scale and human body temperatures makes it a really good tool for describing our environment, describing the weather, uh, describing uh, HVAC, air conditioning, uh, how we're keeping our room temperatures. Uh, but the scientific community tends to avoid the Fahrenheit scale. Instead, in the uh, SI system, we tend to use the Celsius scale. The Celsius scale is defined so that zero degrees Celsius is the temperature where water freezes. And 100 degrees Celsius is the temperature where water boils. And that relationship with water makes it a very useful scale for dealing with chemistry and also a very useful scale for dealing with any sorts of culinary activities. You have probably come across at some point the conversion formula Fahrenheit is 9 fifths Celsius plus 32 or rewriting that Celsius is 5 ninths Fahrenheit minus 32 you can use these formulas to convert between Fahrenheit and Celsius temperatures. I'm not going to bother with that for the most part because, well, quite honestly, that's kind of boring. I'd rather get to some interesting things instead. One of the important things scientifically for dealing with either Fahrenheit or Celsius is understanding that these are relative scales. Every scale that we have dealt with previously has been an absolute scale, right? Measurement of time elapsed is probably the closest thing we have to a relative scale otherwise because, well, time elapsed since when? But measurements of distances, measurements of speeds, accelerations, forces, energy, these are all absolute scales. And the difference between an absolute scale and a relative scale is zero is arbitrary in a relative scale. It doesn't make sense to talk about a particular zero point as being null, right? A zero degree temperature is not the absence of temperature. And in fact, negative temperatures are very meaningful. As a consequence of that, whenever you're dealing with a relative scale, multiplication is nonsense. Right, the example I led off with, an 80 degree day does not have twice as much temperature as a 40 degree night. That's nonsense. And so we are limited in what we can do with a relative scale. But things start to really expand for us when we realize that differences are meaningful. Right? The difference between the daytime temperature and the overnight temperature, in the example I've been giving, that's also 40 degrees, 
but that's a meaningful number, right? If we go from an 80 degree day to a 40 degree night, that's a 40 degree drop in temperature. If we go from an 80 degree day to a 60 degree night, that's only a 20 degree drop in temperature. The temperature drops by half as much. And as soon as we start talking about differences, that's where things become meaningful. Of course, that also gives us some confusion in our notation, right? If we are looking at a, I guess that was a night I've been saying, a night that has a 40 degree Fahrenheit temperature, or a drop in temperature of 40 degrees. If you stop and think about it, these two things are very different kinds of measurements. And so for that reason, you will often see a different way of denoting the unit. We will use degree Fahrenheit or degree Celsius to represent the temperature of an object. And then we can say the drop in temperature was 40 Fahrenheit degrees or some number of Celsius degrees. So using this notation of the degree symbol after as your difference to, uh, to show that they're really measuring different things. Once again, this is something that you've probably seen before but haven't really paid much thought to. A common error, a common issue that people have in discussing percents is if something drops from 90% to 75%, we can subtract those and call it a 15 percentage point uh, decrease. But a 15% decrease of 90% is actually something a little bit different. A 15% decrease of 90% would be 90% minus 15% of 90%, which comes out at something like 77%. Um, so that's a very different meaning, and we have to be careful with our language. We're not talking about percents now, but uh, very often, students in this course have seen that sort of thing before, so if you have, there's something to kind of keep in mind and keep that idea. Another option that we have is to sidestep the idea of relative scale entirely. In a time more recent than the discussion of the Fahrenheit and Celsius scales, scientists have realized that there is an absolute zero temperature. If we say that temperature is in some way related to the internal energy, the movement of the molecules within an object, well then there can, at least in theory, be a point at which the, ob uh, the molecules stop moving. And you can't get a lower internal energy than the molecules stop moving because that would be zero energy. Right? So the temperature that corresponds to that point, we've given the name absolute zero. And as far as scientists are aware, it is not physically possible to ever get something actually to absolute zero, although we can get arbitrarily close using modern technology. 
the interesting thing about this is that scientists have been able to make the prediction that this is going to occur at a temperature of negative 273.15 degrees Celsius. Right. That brings us to the Kelvin scale, named after William Thompson, the Lord Kelvin, um, a um, British, um, I think Duke was his title, but Lord of Kelvin, uh, who did a lot of work in trying to show that absolute zero was actually a thing among his many contributions to the development of science. But the Kelvin scale is an absolute scale, which means we don't need the degree symbol. We're going to use a capital K to represent the unit of Kelvin. And we're going to set that zero Kelvin is equal to negative 273 degrees Celsius. And then we're going to use the exact same step. So that 273 Kelvin is zero degrees Celsius. And for example, 300 Kelvin, well, 273, I'm sorry, uh, 300 minus 273 is 27. All right, 27 degrees Celsius. Uh, I guess I can also go to the Fahrenheit formula. Fahrenheit is 9 fifths times Celsius plus 32. And if I find a calculator, I can punch that into my calculator. There's my calculator. So we take 9 fifths times 32, I'm sorry, 9 fifths times 27 plus 32, my calculator tells me is 80.6. All right, so 27 degrees is hot for room temperature. Usually I think of room temperature as uh, 27, or 72 degrees Fahrenheit. But because it is this nice round number in Kelvin, very often you'll see a uh, 300 Kelvin room temperature being used. Uh, understanding that that is hot for room temperature, but it's a nice number that makes the calculations easy is probably the most important thing to know about the Kelvin scale for right now. In order to measure a temperature, we use a device called a thermometer. This is not revolutionary for you. For the most part in today's society, we use digital thermometers. We use a piece of electronics called a thermocouple, which is literally just two pieces of metal of different types that are twisted together. And because the metals are different materials, they react to temperatures differently. And it turns out that if you choose the metals correctly, you can calibrate a sensor to read electrical current that is forced to flow through the wire based on the temperature of the environment. And you can translate that into a temperature and you can display that result on a digital readout. And that's how most uh, thermometers work. In days past, I say days past, this was the only thing that was available when I was in uh, middle school. Digital thermometers started to become popular uh, when I was a student. All right. But they are still recent enough that I suspect that most of you have spent at least a little bit of time looking at a bulb thermometer. Originally, uh, thermometers were filled with mercury. It wasn't until they were in use for quite some time that people realized that mercury is hazardous, and they started switching it out to a, an ethyl alcohol. Right. So if you see a thermometer and it has a silver liquid inside, that is a mercury thermometer. 
Mercury thermometers are more precise and are useful in sciences. Uh, I think that I might be able to get us to use a mercury thermometer at some point in a lab, but I'm not sure. They keep breaking and we don't want to buy new ones. Uh, but if you've ever seen a thermometer that had a red liquid inside, that's ethyl alcohol that has food coloring in it. If I can hit the right button. But a thermometer works in this style under the process of thermal expansion. And thermal expansion, very simply, is that the volume of a material increases with temperature. Uh, here in southwestern Pennsylvania, we see the uh, results of thermal expansion every year in our roads. In the summer months, the heat causes the asphalt of the roads to expand, which is on its own not that much of a problem. But then in the autumn, the temperatures drop, uh, the asphalt cools, so it shrinks. But because it had expanded, as it shrinks, it's going to create cracks and crevices throughout the road. Autumns tend to be wet, rainy months, so we end up with rain pooling in all of these cracks. And then we get to the winter where that rain freezes. As water freezes to ice, it expands. That's not thermal expansion, that's something different. That is an entire unit in chemistry and probably a little bit beyond the scope of this course. Right? But as the water freezes, it causes the asphalt to crumble. And then when the ice thaws in spring, the support that it had provided uh, goes away with it and we end up with crumbling potholes throughout our roads. The same process can be controlled in a thermometer. If we have a known volume of liquid in our thermometer, and we have a very narrow tube in which it can raise and lower, then as temperature increases, that liquid will rise up in the tube. As temperature drops, the liquid will fall down. The way that we talk about thermal expansion mathematically can be a little bit messy. The rules for solids and liquids and gases are all different, uh, but mostly it comes down to how we record the property. Right? The rate of thermal expansion, the amount by which the volume changes, is going to depend on the temperature difference Right? The greater the temperature difference, the more expansion you will have. It's going to depend on the volume. Right? So the expansion happens per unit volume. The more of the material you have, the more overall expansion you will have, because every part of the material will expand. And then it's also dependent on the property of the material. So we're going to have some uh, thermal expansion coefficient uh, for liquids, we tend to use the Greek letter beta, which is just a stylized looking B, as our variable for that. So the safer thermometers that use ethanol, the coefficient of expansion is 1.12 times 10 to the negative third per Celsius degree. Mercury, which is a better thermometer, but you then have to deal with the possibility of mercury poisoning, has a thermal expansion coefficient of 1.8 times 10 to the negative fourth per Celsius degree. All right, so the thermal expansion coefficient of mercury is quite a bit smaller. 
which means that Mercury is going to give you a finer point of adjustment. And that's the reason that it tends to work better than ethanol. All right, but let's say that we have one milliliter of fluid in our thermometer, and we're going to look at a temperature difference of 20 Celsius degrees. All right, that's roughly the difference between the freezing point of water and a common room temperature. It's also roughly the difference between a common room temperature and human body temperature. All right, so over that amount of space for ethanol, well, the change in volume is going to be 1.12 times 10 to the negative third per degree Celsius times one milliliter times a change of 20 Celsius degrees. And when I plug that into my calculator, I get 0 0.022 milliliters. That's not a lot of a difference. But if you make a skinny enough tube, you can make 0 0.022 milliliters seem like a couple of centimeters of height difference. For mercury, we instead have 1.8 times 10 to the negative 4. which gives me 0 0.0036 milliliters. And at first glance, you would think that that's worse, right? You get less of a volume change. But if you stop and think about it, that means you need less mercury in order to register the difference. Or put in other words, you can put more mercury in the thermometer in order to get a more drastic difference. So my ethanol, I used one milliliter. To get the same change in mercury, I might have to use a couple of milliliters, but I can use that as a way of tuning my instrument and I can get a lot more fine precision out of trying to read the mercury bulb than I can out of trying to read the ethanol bulb. Right. The actual manufacturer of a thermometer is a little bit beyond the scope of this course, but understanding the idea of thermal expansion and how that plays into the measure of temperature, I think is an absolutely fascinating uh, topic that doesn't get as much discussion as it deserves. In any event, that's all I have for you today, so I'll wrap up with that. As always, thanks for joining me, and I'll see you next time.